Previously to this position, I wrote for another great horror magazine called Room Org, which is a Canadian mag. And um, the Fan Expo, Festival of Fear, uh, there was this kid in my neighborhood I used to bring on as a volunteer when we did these things. And uh, someone had given him a movie, a DVD. And after the day was over, I had con fatigue, it was over. I said, enough of this. He said, wait, wait, Chris, wait, I got, someone gave me this, and uh, I, I don't want it. You can, you can have it. I'm like, well, what is it? And it was this movie, this documentary about this woman, and uh, I knew nothing about her. Vaguely, I'd heard the name around, but I wasn't really plugged into what was going on with her and, and her various endeavors. So on a slow night, I popped this movie up, and uh, lo and behold, I was blown away. Uh, the name of the movie was... Celluloid Horror? Celluloid Horror. It was a neat little homegrown th thing. You opened it up and actually talked. It was you talking, right? Okay. That was Udo Kier. It was Udo Kier. It was with the killer. So, the woman in question was Miss Kayla Janice, who sits over to my right and your left. And uh, the documentary was about her festival that she started from the grassroots up, well, Cine Muerte out, out in the west, Calgary, right? Vancouver. Vancouver. And uh, it wasn't just a documentary about a girl running a festival. It was a kind of warts and all look into this person's life. Kayla had opened the doors to her life and let people in. And uh, we got a real glimpse of the creative process about who she was, her enthusiasm for the genre. It was honest, it was open, and it was a portrait of a, an incredibly dedicated woman who clearly, I'm getting shivers just talking about it, who clearly loved what she did. And finding that kind of raw passion uh, is something I've always looked for, and I saw it. And when I get passionate about something, I get serious about it. So I don't know if you remember this, but I looked you up on the internet. I think I found you on MySpace or something. That's how long ago that was. MySpace. <laughs> I was like, oh my god, I love you. She was very casual about it. She's like, oh, that thing, that's so old, you know. I'm kind of embarrassed <laughs> about it now, blah, blah. Well, that was the end of that. So now I was firmly aware who this, uh, this woman was and, and was attuned to her every, every move, which we'll find out about some of those moves in a minute. So now, because where I am at Fangoria, I'm honored to have Kayla on board to steer the brave new vision of, for our website, Fangoria.com. So if you like the site, the way it's working now, it's 100% attributed to her. And hopefully it'll keep improving and uh, keep bringing people back because it's her brain steering that boat. And I'm more than happy to have that happen. Uh, the reason we're here now is to talk about her new book. Not, what is this, your third book? Second. Second book. Women. Subtly titled House of Psychotic Women, <laughs> which take, takes its title from a Carlos, is it Carlos Arad? 1972, three, something we're in that vicinity, a Spanish horror film that also goes under the name Blue Eyes of the Broken Doll. Blue Eyes of the Broken Doll. It stars Paul Nashi. Paul Nashi, of course, the late great Paul Nashi. But really, that has nothing to do with, with uh, the price of milk. This book, again, is an even further down the wormhole, further down the spiral, peek into this woman's soul. Um, if you really, really, really want to see an artist completely rolled on her back and exposed and unafraid, well, a little bit afraid, because I know you were a little bit afraid of, before it was released, uh, maybe how some, what some people might think about some of this stuff in there. It's pretty eye-opening. Uh, but it is, it's a, you know, it's a biography of, of this brave author and personality and, and again, horror exploitation film fan. So she basically tells her life, um, mirrored in her love of these movies that exemplify the quote unquote psychotic woman on screen in these crazy movies. So it is a reference book to some of the greatest movies about crazy ladies, but it's also, again, a peek into Kayla Janice's soul. So I'd like to, for you to put your hands together and applaud uh, Kayla Janice. I, I, I want to bring it back. You know, this is a women in horror panel, and I can't think of a, a you know a better person to be the spokesperson for women in horror because Kayla doesn't run around. I'm a woman and I'm in horror. It's like she's a person. She just happens to be a woman, so has a unique perspective into the genre. A unique. Uh, she can offer a unique perspective into the genre and working within it and all the, the stigmas and prejudices that come with that. Um, but I want to talk a bit about your. No, we don't spoil the whole thing because Kayla is selling her book downstairs, so we're not going to get too deep into it. But about your upbringing and maybe the first time where you really were attuned to these bizarre films, and the first time they, sp maybe the first one that really spoke to you. Okay. Um, well, I was pretty lucky as a kid because my parents were horror fans. Uh, they let me watch horror films from a really young age. 
uh, and they were one of the first things that I, um, one of the first pop cultural things that I responded to as a kid really visibly. Um, and so my dad would cut articles out of the paper for me about Dracula or about TV horror hosts or whatever. Um, and he would buy me books at flea markets and stuff and uh, we'd watch creature features and he would actually even wake me up in the middle of the night to watch movies. And uh, because there would be these late night shows, it'd be like two in the morning like a, and often like old AIP movies and Hammer films. Um, and his favorite was Peter Cushing, and so I became very interested in Peter Cushing because my dad liked him. Um, and my mother loved uh, movie of the week type uh, horror films and stuff. So, so I had a pretty well-rounded um, kind of horror upbringing. And I mean, the first one of the big movies for me as a kid was um, Horror Express. Horror Express uh, was probably the first... Uh, my first memory, really, it's, it's, it's one of my first memories of being alive, is watching Horror Express. Um, and the, the, one of the characters in the movie became, ended up be becoming the boogeyman who lived in my closet for like years, it, who I was terrified of. Um, and Has everyone seen Horror Express? Peter Cushing, Christopher Lee, and Telly Sabala support the Trans-Siberian yeah. Express. And there's like a, uh, like a Russian priest who gets possessed at some point, his eyes are glowing red. Um, and when I was a kid, uh, this guy lived in my closet, and every night, you know, he would be trying to get me to go in the closet. And uh, except in my dreams, his eyes were green, so I always called him the man with green eyes. And I later found out it was because I'd watched the movie on a black and white television, and so I just gave it him green eyes. Um, but so Horror Express was a really big one. But but in terms of me uh, starting to think a lot about the subject of this book, in terms of uh, fe the ways that female neurosis is represented on screen um, and the ways that I related to that and why I was attracted to those movies and why I wanted to write about them and stuff. Um, the two biggest ones probably are The Entity and uh, Possession, Andrzej Zhuwowski's Possession. Who I imagine, I mean, it used to be obscure. I think most people, a lot of people have seen it now. If you haven't, it's Possession, fantastic. Have you seen it, everyone? <coughs> Isabella Johnny, Sam Neill. Okay, wow. you have to see this movie. It's it's mind blowing, and you may hate it when you first see it. But I mean, I've heard from a lot of people who've watched it um, that didn't like it the first time round. They just like loved it later. But it's a very very emotional and intense movie. That the basis of the story is just like it's a divorce. So it's it's very close in a lot of ways to Cronenberg's film The Brood. You know, a lot of the same themes are very similar movies in some ways. Um, and it's about a divorce. And it's about the husband trying to figure out what's wrong with the wife. Why has the wife suddenly like kind of gone crazy? And she does. She goes crazy. It is one of the most transfixing performances you'll ever see. Um, and that movie was kind of one of the big ones that made me start looking into writing about these films, um, but also looking into, you know, people are like, well, how can you even relate to that movie? That movie's so fantastical. It's so out there. Like, who could relate to that, you know? And I was like, I can totally relate to that movie. I can relate to that character. Um, and people found that really frightening, that I would even say that. But, you know, so once I started trying to write the book, I was really thinking a lot about, um, like, looking back at different events and, like, what had led me to be attracted to certain types of films. And I think that we do that all the time with any kind of film, whether it's comedies or whatever. We always look for something we can kind of hang on to or some there's something we can relate to about that movie or else we probably wouldn't be interested in watching it. Um, and so I think a lot of people can do this with, with the movies in their lives, you know. And, and so basically the book is a story, a chronological story of different events throughout my life, but then going in and out of film analysis as I look at the different women in the films. And so it's not really a book about our horror films misogynistic or anything like that. I kind of take the movies on their own terms. Um, and I do feel there's tons of books and tons of articles out there about uh, trying to, you know, trying to like have that discussion about like, are women objectified in horror and stuff like that. And so that's not really what the book is about. Um, so, and I mean, and I don't know if that's what you want to talk about or not, but. Well, we can, we can use that as a springboard. I guess I could just ask the question bluntly. We'll get back to the book, but are women objectified in horror films? Um, I think that, I think there have been periods where exploitation films in general, I mean, objectifying is, is, uh, I think that everyone in horror and anyone in any kind of art 
because it becomes the, uh, the subject, you know, it, it's objectified in a certain way. I mean, I objectify my own parents and siblings, you know, like, I mean, when I write about them, even in the book, like, I have objectified them in a certain way. But I think that uh, horror films are, I think horror is a very feminine genre in a lot of ways, and a lot of horror films are specifically dealing with anxieties concerning femininity. And I think that to say that a male director is not, uh, doesn't have the right to try to explore that, uh, or doesn't have the right to explore his vision of femininity or what his experience has been like with women, um, I don't think that's valid. I think I think a male I think a male writer or director has just as much right to talk about the female experience as a woman does because men have an experience of women and of femininity that's just as valid. Um, but for whatever reason, a lot of women have not have chosen to not be writers and directors of horror films, and so it ends up being men who are kind of telling these stories. And I think that lately there's been, uh, you know, there's been a turn, and obviously there are way more female horror directors and writers now, and more, like most of all, producers, though. There's tons of women that are producing horror films now, um, which is really great, too, because they're kind of taking a creative role, putting teams together, using all kinds of organizational skills, but creative skills at the same time. And so I've actually seen uh, a proliferation of female producers more lately than directors. But I feel that probably you can you can let you can be objectified as much as you want to or not. You know, I mean, I always kind of feel like if you feel like you're being exploited, then you are, and if you don't feel like you're being exploited, then you're not. Right. You know, yeah. like. Well, let's talk about that little, that shift that you're talking about. Can you cite in your estimation why? the worm is turning for women? Well, I mean, I think part of it is, for years, I mean, even for myself being a horror fan, um, you know, I was born in 1972, and so, I mean, we didn't have the internet until I was already in my mid-20s or whatever, and so meeting other horror fans or, you know, finding anybody else who was interested in the same stuff as you uh, was very difficult at that time. And so being a woman trying to find other women interested in horror fans was even harder. Um, and I think the proliferation of film festivals has helped a lot. There's way more film festivals than, are, than there used to be. And there's a lot more grassroots festivals. There's lots of smaller festivals in smaller communities. Um, so I think the combination of the festivals being kind of a meeting point and bringing people out and conventions like this and stuff, um, and then also the internet and being able to like co communicate with people like all over the world um, has made basically like a support system for people who um, who want to learn how to do this and who maybe felt like they didn't have the connections or the skills or whatever and now they have this gigantic global support network to help them do this. So I think I think that that's part of the reason. Um, I think also because there's been so much criticism about horror, um, especially in terms of misogyny, the misogyny debate, you know. Um, I think that horror fans started to become really savvy about a lot of these issues. Like they, horror fans are aware of these issues way more than people give them credit for, you know. Like horror fans are critical. They do think about the things that they see and watch. Um, and I think that because of all the sort of criticism and the academic writing and all kinds of, you know, writing and everything and blogging and that, that's built up around these types of films, um, it's made people aware of the sort of stereotypes and tropes that these kinds of films have, and then it makes them think of like interesting ways to maybe subvert those things. And I think women are in a position right now when they're writing and directing these kind of movies, they want to look at this history and they want to subvert it, you know, somehow. So it is a really fertile ground for a lot of exploration and stuff right now. When did you start at Cinemoirte? When was that? Uh, two, no, 1999. And it ran till? 2005. Okay, so it had a good run. Um, you're talking about festivals, and if, if I was to say to you that you were, you were, you are a trailblazer in many respects, because I can't think of many women who started their own horror film festivals, ever, anywhere. Am I right or am I there wrong? There two other ones that I, um, I mean, there's more now, but I mean, at the time, um, at the time, there was uh, Dead by Dawn in Edinburgh, Scotland. Adele Hartley started that. Um, she still runs it single-handedly and celebrated her 20th year this year. So she's been doing it. Uh, she was doing it before I was. 
Um, uh, Rachel Bolofsky at Screamfest in LA may have been may have started before Santa Muerte. I'm not sure. So there were like a handful of us, but it's it was still unusual at the time. You know, when we met each other, I still have never met Rachel, but I mean. When I met Adele Hartley from Dead by Dawn, we just clicked instantly because we both felt like we didn't know any other women who were organizing horror film festivals, you know, who weren't just going to horror festivals, um, you know, with their boyfriends or whatever, but who were actually choosing to go there and maybe going with other women there and not only that, but actually organizing the whole thing and like making it uh, come together, programming the films and dealing with all the practicalities of of the operations of the of the event and everything. Um, so I mean, I think Santa Muerte was early, but it definitely wasn't uh, the first one run by a woman. So the big question is, uh, you're, you're on this role, you, you've created this, uh, in many ways, iconic festival that has import and gravitas to it. Uh, why walk away from it? Why give it up? Did you walk away? Were there other circumstances? That led yeah, to that. there was there was two things. I mean, one of which was that I moved to Texas. I started working for the Alamo Draft House Cinema um, in like 2003, and so I was a programmer there. And I still kept doing the festival for maybe two years from afar, thinking I could just kind of organize everything from afar and then come up like two weeks before. Back up. Everyone know what the Alamo Draft House is? Alamo Draft House is a movie theater chain. Uh, well, at the time it wasn't a chain. It was like a kind of mom and pop theater. Um, and it became famous. It's, it's very famous now and it's a very big uh, organization now. But it started as a husband and wife team. They started this movie theater. Their idea was that they were going to serve beer and food right to you at your table. Um, so you have like these, it's basically like a movie theater. Every second row is taken out and there's a long bar table put there. And they have kind of gutters in between the rows. So you have a menu, there's like a tiny light underneath the table, you can order food, write it on a piece of paper, stick it there, this waiter comes by and grabs it, and then just comes and brings you your food. Um, and, then they, and then you can keep doing this the whole time. You want another beer, you know, you want wine or whatever, you just keep putting the paper there and the person comes and gets it and then they, they just keep delivering stuff to you the whole time. And it was kind of amazing because, um, you know, like people know that movie theaters make all their money on concessions, but once the people are in the theater, most of them aren't going to leave if they want more stuff, you know. Um, and so it was like, wow, we can make double, we can sell double the stuff because halfway through the movie they want more things, you know. Um, so it was actually totally brilliant and at the time, they were first playing second run films. So they were just playing um, new movies that had kind of done their first run in the theater and they're playing them second run. Um, but then because they were, it, it eventually started in Austin that they were outgrossing the first run theaters because people would wait until the movie would play at their theater because they wanted to have beer <laughs> and food while they watched it. So then they started getting first run movies and then they started getting big guests to come in and stuff and now there's been, you know, Quentin Tarantino's had run a few film festivals there, Bill Murray's been there, like, I mean, it's huge. So anyway, but at the time when I first started working there, it was a very small place and uh, my office was like in the owner's house, like we'd just go to his living room and that was the office. Um, and so I was thinking that I could run Cine Muerte, like, you know, while I was there and come up and do it and it just wasn't working. It was way too hard to promote. Um, basically, like, the people who were supposed to be putting up posters and delivering <coughs> programs and stuff like that weren't really doing it, But and by the time I would arrive, it would be too late. But the other big, big reason why I stopped doing it is because the press, the local press, was not interested at all, you know? So it was like, um, you know, horror magazines around the world or horror websites would write about it and people would say that they liked the programming and whatever, but the fact is that the press in Vancouver could care less, you know. Um, they thought it was, like, just stupid. It was a niche festival that catered to people who just wanted to watch TNA and um, they just, like, they had a lot of stereotypes about the genre and even the theater that I did it in when I first went there, um, they thought that the horror fans were gonna like rip the chairs out of the, the theater and like cut the screen and they thought like that's what horror fans are like, that we just come in and trash the place. And so I had to kind of convince them that no, no, they actually just want to watch the movie, you know. Um, and so there's just a lot of stereotypes and the paper didn't care, so the paper like never wrote anything about it, you know. Um, I think the last year when I announced that it was going to be my final year, then they wrote a big article about it and I was like, well, 
you know. Yeah, thanks for nothing. Um, but yeah, it was like really hard to get them to, they, they just had this idea that I was like in my basement playing VHS tapes to people or something, you know. And meanwhile, I had guests, like I had Jörg Budgerite, the director of Necromantic, I had Jean Roland, I had Udo Kier, I had like, well, Jeff Lieberman, who's here downstairs, uh, who made Blue Sunshine and um, Squirm. Squirm, and he's just got a new DVD of Remote Control down there. Um, but so I had, you know, guests, and I was I worked at a video store, and so I worked at a video store like seven days a week, pretty much, and just used my money from the video store to put on this festival. I paid for everything myself, um, and then I would spend the next year kind of paying off my credit card, and then I would start all over again and do it again. But yeah, but so so it's basically like the fact that the press like was not interested was like a huge reason why it didn't continue. And then the, because I had moved to Texas and started working for this theater, it just seemed like well it's time to walk away. So. Well, Kayla Kayla lives in Montreal, and works in Montreal, and um, she again not only started this film festival, not only went to Texas to program this incredibly influential theater. Uh, but also started her own movie theater called, appropriately enough, we're talking about Jeff Lieberman, Blue Sunshine. Uh, we don't have anyone from Montreal here, I presume. But um, it was an incredible experiment, I guess, wasn't it? Uh, you want to tell us a little bit about your theater that you owned and operated? Sure. Okay. Um, I started it with a friend of mine, Dave Bertrand, who also writes for Fangoria sometimes, and he lives in Toronto and is a, a DJ there at a place called Sex Laser. Yeah, Sex Laser. <laughs> right in Toronto, Sex Laser. <laughs> Um, but and we barely knew each other. But for some reason, uh, there was a contest I, I used to run in Vancouver called Bloodshots. It was a 48-hour horror filmmaking contest, and um, uh, he had participated in this contest for many years as a producer. And for some reason, I just kind of was like, this guy would be a good business partner, you know. And so I just asked him out of the blue, do you want to move to Montreal and start a movie theater? And the reason I wanted to do it there is because they have a big film festival, the Fantasia. Film festival, just big genre film festival. If you guys are into this type of stuff, it's horror, sci-fi, kung fu, action. Um, the second biggest in the world. At this time. It is, yeah. It's it's yeah, it's huge. Um, and uh, so anyway, so I was like, I knew that there was a movie-going audience in Montreal and people who would actually wait in a line and like wait to get in and be excited and stuff. And so I kind of wanted to do it there. Um, and it was a fantastic experience. I mean, we, we leased a place for two years. It was not a real theater, it was a loft, you know, which we then built and converted into a small micro cinema that had like 75 seats. And um, we, we had like endless problems with the city. And we kind of, we ended up having to ride it out for two years where we couldn't get a single permit. <laughs> we actually, like people in Montreal don't really know this, but we had we didn't even have an occupation permit to be running the place. Um, we uh, we signed the we you know before we signed the lease we went to the to to get a approval from the city that we'd be able to do it there and they're like oh yes everything's fine you know but then when we actually went to do it they wouldn't give us the permits and so we basically ran an illegal movie theater for two years. Um, we had 16 millimeter, uh, various forms of video, but we tried to do 16 millimeter film as much as possible because 16 millimeter, I don't know if, any, if there's any budding exhibition people here and you wanna do this yourself, 16 millimeter is portable, you can do it anywhere. Um, and you just need a speaker to hook it up to or a pair of speakers or whatever, and you can make a movie theater anywhere. Um, and so I'm a big fan of 16 millimeter because it's, because it's portable and because the film prints are much lighter than 35 millimeter prints and so it's easier to ship them and so we were able to ship films in from like all over the world, uh, rare film prints of certain films and um, so we just, we had a regular regular clientele that came all the time and I mean every, it, it was fine, we were very supported there, we were, the paper was giving us awards and stuff like that for the programming. Um, but ultimately, we were just like on a very, very busy and expensive street, and so it was more of an operational thing where we were just like, you know, we need to reconfigure somewhere else, like when our lease is up. So we may still open again at some point somewhere else. Um, but it was, the place was called Blue Sunshine, and it was named after Jeff Lieberman's movie, who I am honored to be sitting next to downstairs. <laughs> Don't visit Lieberman. So it's Hilarious. kind of amazing, yeah. Hilarious guy. Uh, well, let's talk about the book. Um, how many movies are in the book? I think there's around.